The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Hear now the word of the Lord as it is found in the little epistle of Jude, beginning at verse 8. Yet in like manner, these people, also relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. These people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they're destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them! For they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are blemishes on your love feasts. as They feast with you without fear, looking after themselves. They're waterless clouds, swept along by winds, fruitless trees and laid on them, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame. Wandering stars, for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all, and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we are in the midst of a five-week-long series in the little epistle of Jude. We're in the third week, and with each successive week, I become just that much more convicted and terrified by the word of truth because... It uh, cuts across the grain of our whole culture, and it cuts across the grain of my most native instincts and impulses. It is so incredibly convicting. I see my own heart and my own life uh, so clearly in its light. I I have prayed that you would as well. So as we come to this, uh, his word, let's, let's pray that he would do his work in and through us. Father, thank you for your word. <clears throat> thank you for the, the parts of your word that convict us deeply and as well as the parts that uh, comfort us thoroughly. Uh, we pray that you would now uh, move upon us that we might hear and heed your word of truth. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was about 400 years ago that William Shakespeare wrote, This above all, to thine own self be true. In the centuries since, it seems that modern men have taken that all too seriously and applied it in extremis. Soren Kierkegaard put it this way, The greatest hazard men face in this life is losing one's self. Herman Hess, in his classic Siddhartha, said, Be yourself, trust yourself, love yourself, find the source of truth and happiness within yourself. Bertrand Russell wrote, Belief in self is the first and most fundamental faith. Ayn Rand said, the self cannot and must not be sacrificed. 
Andre Gide said, my salvation was finally realized when I told myself just to be me. Sounds like a Muppet song, doesn't it? <laughs> Loving yourself is the greatest revolution, Margaret Sanger said. These, these maxims have become so much a part of our world, a part of our culture, that they're woven into the context of almost everything. And thus, I think Andrew Fellows is right in declaring us to be uh, the me, my selfie, and I generation. But we believe fundamentally in, in the sovereign self. Self-realization, self-actualization, self-confidence, self-assurance, self-reliance, self-esteem. These are the baseline for how we judge the world and all of its doings. G.K. Chesterton, a hundred years ago, said that belief in self is almost the motto of the modern world. But he also said, it is not merely a sin, it is a weakness. In uh, this really r- remarkable new book edited by Colin Hansen, Hansen uh, writes this, Evangelical apologists have traditionally responded with biblical proofs and technical counterpoints to the scientific materialism popularized in the last decade plus by the so-called new atheists, including people like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens. But he asks, what if science, reason, and logic aren't the problem or the solution to firm faith? What if the challenge runs far deeper. What if the problem of our secular age is more fundamental? What if the problem is uh, not so much the credibility of claims about a sovereign God as the credibility of claims about a sovereign self? Carl Truman, in the same book, uh, puts it this way. He says, uh, the ultimate dynamic driving this secular age is the denial of our creatureliness and the assertion of our absolute autonomy. Is the psychological self that allows us to claim that we are who we think we are and to repudiate all forms of external authority, even that of our own biology. Human nature has become thus a psychological or, or, or even a merely social construct. And in the process, we have become our own gods. Uh, we worship At the altar of self, we bow before the idol of self. Uh, We have become devotees of a cult of self. It was danger that Jude would have immediately recognized. See, Jude writes this little letter as a warning. A warning to the church to contend for the faith, verse 3, against certain ungodly people who had crept into the midst of the church unawares, verse 4. They were, in a sense, wolves in sheep's clothing. So understand, the message of Jude is written to us. It's written to the church. This isn't a a diatribe against the sins of the world. This is a declaration to us for us to be aware, for us to be alert, for us to pay heed, for us to contend for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. 
In verses 5 through 7, Jude describes these wolves in sheep's clothing. He compares them to the unbelieving Israelites during the time of the Exodus who were judged. He compares them to the fallen angels with Lucifer who were judged. He compares them to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah who were judged. And then, beginning in this passage, in verses 8 through 16, uh, Jude now catalogs the sins displayed by these wolves in sheep's clothing. In verse 8, he says, They defile the flesh and reject authority. They blaspheme, speaking evil of the dignities, as the King James Version puts it. In verse 10, he says that these wolves in sheep's clothing are unreasoning. Verse 11, they walk in the way of Cain. They, they commit Balaam's error. They actually abandon themselves for the sake of greed. And then, throwing off all moral authority, they rush headlong into Korah's rebellion. Verse 12, they are blemishes in the love feasts of the church. They're like waterless clouds and fruitless trees. Verse 13, they're wild waves and wandering stars. Verse 15, they are ungodly. Verse 16, they're grumblers, malcontents, and loud mouth boasters. Now, last week we saw in, um, in the passage uh, the application of, uh, of an idea introduced by Peter Davids in his uh, wonderful commentary on Jude. It's the idea that the problem uh, with these wolves in sheep's clothing was not theological or doctrinal. It, it was, at root, moral. This is uh, what he says. It's not that these men and women actually denied any particular doctrine about Jesus. In terms of the creed that they could sign, they may well have been just as orthodox as Jude himself. But it was their behavior that was a denial of Christ. I don't know about you, but that terrifies me. And so, what we find is that there is this deep moral flaw. But I want you to notice uh, that in this great catalog of sins, uh, notice that underlying all of it is an affection for self, a commitment to self, a reliance upon self, an obsession with self. Uh, Did you see it? Verse 8, they rely on their own dreaming. Verse 10, they rely on their own instinct. And all of the things that they don't understand are the very things that destroy them. Verse 12, they look out for themselves. Verse 16, they follow their own desires. It seems that they became the judge of all things. They, uh, they determined what they could and could not do, what they should or should not uh, uh, hold to. They, 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 they uh, baptized all of their experience upon all of their theology so that they and their feelings and their affections and their desires became the dominating force in determining their whole life. Uh, they, they, they were, in a sense, in charge. They were sovereign uh, because they were consumed with self. Now this, uh, Jude very colorfully and ardently declares uh, what the whole of the scriptures say over and over again. 
He who seeks his own desire quarrels against sound wisdom, Proverbs 18 says. Remember the, the, the declaration that uh, really spelled the whole uh, tale of the time of the judges? Remember this? In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. How about this in Genesis chapter 11? They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad. Second Timothy, the Apostle Paul warns us, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for men will be lovers of self. Uh, Lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient, ungrateful, and unholy. You see, the problem with the self, as self-sure as we might be, is that we're fallen, that we're sinful. And as the prophet Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. It is desperately sick. Who can understand it? So Jude, uh, trying to paint this picture for us, uh, draws upon a series of scriptural images. Uh, First, he says that these wolves in sheep's clothing are are like waterless clouds. Uh, This is an image from Proverbs chapter uh, 25, verse 14. Uh, the idea here is that uh, they're charlatans. They're fakes. Uh, they're full of promise. Uh, but there is no delivery whatsoever. There's no fulfillment. But not only are they this, um, this empty promise, uh, we're told that uh, they're also fruitless trees, twice dead and uprooted. Here he takes the image of unfruitfulness one step further and building on the image of Psalm 1, verses 3 and 4, uh, shows us uh, that they are chaff, suitable only for burning. They're also wild waves, he says, foaming up their shame. This is an image from Isaiah 57. Uh, The idea here is uh, that they bring only chaos and danger. There are also wandering stars. Uh, this is an image from Isaiah chapter 14. Uh, the uh, idea here is uh, that these wandering stars are both unnatural and unreliable. The, these are all seafaring terms. Uh, someone out in a, a, a ship uh, doesn't want to see the, the roaring, foaming waves, and he sure doesn't want to see wandering stars. He needs to fix his position. These wolves in sheep's clothing never allow us to fix our position because they are consumed with self. But not only does Jude draw on scriptural images, he also draws on three scriptural stories. Do you see them? Uh, First is the story of Cain. Second is the story of Balaam. And third is the story of Korah. Cain's story comes from Genesis chapter 4. There, we see that Cain's unbridled passion, his his consuming self-desire, leads him first to anger and then to murder. The second story is the story of Balaam. It's the story of consuming greed. Remember Balaam, his story is in Numbers chapters 22 through 24. He was a prophet and he understood that he was not allowed to prophesy anything that was untrue, that the Lord did not command him. And yet at the same time, he was being offered a lot of money by the king of Moab, Balak, uh, to curse the people of Israel. So Balaam tried to do a workaround. He tried to figure out a way to do both, be honest 
and get the money. And as a result, he becomes a byword in the scriptures for greed. Unbridled passion, unbridled greed. The third story is the story of the rebellion of Korah. Numbers uh, chapter 16 tells this story. Korah and a whole host, hundreds of chiefs of tribes among the nation of Israel decided that the yoke of Moses' leadership was just too much to bear. And so they wanted to throw off the authority that had been placed over them by God and and be their own authorities. This helps to explain, by the way, uh, the peculiar language of verse 8 that Jude uses of, uh, of those who blaspheme uh, the dignities, the, those who throw off rightful authority. Korah and uh, his legion did not fare so well in the story. I don't know if you remember, but after they confront Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, the ground opens up and swallows them whole. Jude draws on these scriptural images and then these scriptural stories, but he's not done. He also draws on some apocryphal literature. Verse 9, do you notice it? It's the story of Michael the archangel disputing with the devil over the body of Moses. If you look real quickly in your concordance, you'll discover that's not in the Bible. (laughs) <laughs> no, in, in, it's, uh, it's actually from apocryphal literature. Um, Michael the archangel is mentioned, but only passingly in Daniel's uh, prophecy in chapters 10 and 12. And we do have an instance of, of angels disputing with the devil. In this case, the over the standing of the high priest, Joshua, in Zechariah chapter 3. But we don't have this story. Instead, uh, this story, according to Clement of Alexandria, comes from uh, what is now a lost manuscript called The Assumption of Moses. There is an apocryphal book called The Testimony of Moses, and it ends abruptly. And so some scholars think that The Assumption of Moses was that last part of the testimony of Moses. In in any case, uh, the the whole point of this is that Jude is simply saying these wolves in sheep's clothing will rush in where even angels fear to tread. They take it upon their own authority to engage in spiritual matters too great for them, too great for any of us. Of us, They are full of presumption and spiritual pride. They are just swallowed up by the sovereign self. Even in the book of Revelation, when we see the great host of the saints who have been redeemed, they don't declare that their redemption is because of anything except the Lord's doing. The Lord saved them. The Lord rescued them. It is in the name of the Lord Jesus and by his blood that they are redeemed. There's a second uh, reference to uh, an apocryphal book. It's in verses 16 and 17. It's actually a a somewhat extended quote uh, from a book entitled First Enoch. And in this, uh, we have a direct parallel to Deuteronomy chapter 33, uh, where The divine court descends out of heaven for final judgment. Jude wants to make it absolutely clear. These wolves in sheep's clothing will have their day of reckoning. Judgment will come. The Lord God in his might, in his glory, in his majesty will descend with his full court, his tens of thousands of holy ones, and he will execute his justice and make all things right. It's a terrifying image. It's a comforting image. It's both at the same time. 
Jude wants us to feel the full weight of it. Now, Jude's lesson in all of this is obvious. It's simply this. Uh, this overlay that we impose upon everything, from our theology to our spiritual experience to our relationships uh, to the way we conduct ourselves in the world, this overlay of the sovereign self is not Christianity. Amen. Throughout the scriptures, uh, we are called constantly to live selflessly. Lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, according to Ephesians 4.22. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Isn't that astonishing? The Lord gives us gifts, but they're not for us. They're for everybody else around us. He pours out gifts upon us, not because we're special, but because his grace is specially designed to flow through us to others. Philippians chapter 2, do nothing from selfish ambition uh, ambition or vain uh, conceit, but with humility of mind, uh, regard one another as more important than yourselves. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, let no one seek his own good, but rather that of his neighbor. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Christ died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. See, the thing is, our Self is always self-deceived. And we will always be self-aggrandizing. Always. Because we are sinners. What we need is not a firmer sense of self, self esteem, what we need is Christ esteem. If, if you go looking for yourself, it will be a lifelong journey and you will never find what you're looking for. But if you're in hot pursuit of the knowledge of the living God, he will make you right and free. And then yourself it will be subsumed in a greater purpose. What's, what's the chief end of man? It's to glorify God. To enjoy Him forever. It's, it's not to be in hot pursuit of my own ends, my own desires, my own wishes. So how do we live selflessly? According to the Scriptures, only by the power of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In Titus chapter 2, we read this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. Isn't that the opposite of what our world tells us? To deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. I I love the way James says it. Bridle your body. Bridle your body. Get it under control. Uh, don't, Don't let your feelings, your affections, your circumstances, your existential Uh, experiences uh, become a subjective absolute in your life. A judging everything. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Paul says in Romans chapter 6. This is possible only through the redemption of Jesus Christ. That we, 
that need a Savior to rescue us from us. We need a Redeemer to yank us away from the delirium of selfishness and to make us alive together in Christ Jesus. This is the gospel. I love the ending of Kenneth Branagh's Henry V. It's the end of the Battle of Agincourt. And in the midst of all of the mud and the blood, a scene of carnage, a lone voice begins to sing an old Latin hymn, Non Nobis Domine. Non Nobis Domine. Sed nomine, sed nomine, tu o da gloriam. Not unto us, O Lord. Not unto us, but to your name. To your name may all glory be. This is the great hope of self to have ourselves rescued by the one to whom all glory and honor and praise belong, the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope and our redemption. This is a terrifying picture because I don't know about you, but I look at this list of sins, grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires, loudmouth boasters. Now, I, I think about but Saturday afternoons when our teams have won. <laughs> Showing favoritism to get advantage. Fruitless trees. Waterless clouds. Sounds way too familiar. Thanks be to God. When the tens of thousands of the holy ones come, And the Lord executes his judgment upon all the earth. He will say to the redeemed, your judgment has been satisfied. In the Lord Jesus, your Redeemer. You have been saved by the King, the Judge, and the Lawgiver. Thanks be to God. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.